thanks so much everyone for coming tonight. I am glad that there's people in this room. It's always nerve wracking when you're <laughs> kind of thrown out there to do an event and you wonder who's going to turn up, if anybody. Uh, my name is Micaiah. I'm, I'm now, a, I guess, an entrepreneur, a lifestyle blogger, and a um, social influencer. And what's actually brought me to be called, or to call myself those things, is a business that I started on Facebook in 2012. So in July 2012, I started a Facebook page. Back then it was a big deal. Back then it was a really big deal to start a public Facebook page and put yourself out there. Um, but I do not regret it, because I started a page in a world of social media where there was no bloody algorithm you know, <laughs> controlling us or making it really hard to kind of be seen. Um, but earlier that year, early in 2012, I came up with a business concept. I came up with an idea of sharing my journey that I was going through with health and wellness and getting myself back on track with my mental, emotional and kind of physical health. I had come up with the idea of how I was going to build an member online membership-based business but I had no idea who I was going to sell those memberships to. I had no idea who my customer, potential customers were going to be. You know, I was just a mum who had a full-time job and I was working as a regional manager for a company and just doing my thing, but I had always wanted to have my own business. But I guess when we start a business, we have no one to sell to, you know, pretty quickly. We have to build that kind of interest in us and that trust in us and that customer database. So I looked to Facebook to do that, and my whole purpose of starting the Facebook page in July to 2012 was to build a customer database. That was my whole intention. So I started my brand to motivate me. So I I'd, um, decided that was going to be the company name and it was going to what I was going to build the business around. So it was motivate me. Started the public Facebook page. Didn't talk about the business concept. It was just motivation. It was sharing my journey. It was getting all you know emotional and sharing all those things that people were after with the whole intent of those followers were one day in a few months' time, we're going to become a paid member and shift it over to this paid world. So, this, you know, the, into the business world or the structure of what I was trying to do. So I think that's kind of key right there, is if you are um, launching or starting or even moving into kind of business and you're, you know, and you're looking to build those potential clients or potential customers, that social media is a great place to do that and a great place to start doing it even when you're kind of in that planning stage of business. You might not have executed or you know, really nailed down your business plans, but you can start building interest in you, your brand, your idea, whatever you're kind of putting out there, just by getting present on social media and building those, those likes and getting the numbers up there because ideally they are going to become your customers. And quite early on, that's something I regret not doing early on, was actually trying to convert those likes and those followers into an email database. I was always like, I don't need, it. I don't need the emails, they like my page. I've got hundreds, of, you know, all these tens and thousands of likes, like, it's okay. But when things start going, you know, a bit tougher and the algorithm kind of kicks in and you can't really talk to all those people that like your page, you can with EDMs and you can with email addresses. So quite early on in the piece, try and use different techniques to drive those likes into collecting data, putting them into your MailChimp or wherever you're, you know, you're storing their um, can I Can I gate crash something with that? Yep. So when you see the names coming up on your, your feed, your Facebook or whatever, then how are you getting those to, you know, how are you getting their details and everything so that you can get an email database? So the, the way that I started doing it, because I, um, before I actually sold Motivate Me, I hadn't had much of an email database at all. So I put a lot of effort into trying to convert the 100,000 likes into email databases to try and grow the value that I could offer the, the buyer, obviously, because I wanted to keep my page that had the likes, but I wanted to give them a database. So for three or four months leading into the sale, I made a really big drive of trying to get these people onto MailChimp and collecting emails. So that can be done through, um, I was doing it through giveaways or offering free downloads, um, offering kind of, um, so you can run giveaways through, I was running them through a program called Heyo, it was H-E-Y-O. You, on there, there's different things that you can run, um, competitions, sweepstakes, um, uh, kind of marketing, all sorts of different things and you, you design it on there and then you upload it to your Facebook page and for them to enter, they've got to obviously enter their email address. So it's a really good way to get their data um, through competitions because they generally want to enter. And then if you just um, boost that to your followers and be really target who it's going to, then you can get quality email addresses, not just competition email addresses, which sometimes can be just people who are not even interested in your brand or what you've kind of got to offer. 
Um, so that's heyyo.com, and it's a pay, I think you pay about $300 for the year, um, but it's a really good tool to kind of get quality information from people entering your competitions, as opposed to just a like and a comment and a share on Facebook. And generally now when you're running Facebook competitions, they, the reach can be really poor because as soon as you kind of do that on Facebook, the kind of algorithm pushes it down the line and they've kind of they've got that. In the first couple of years with Facebook, I would run a competition and get thousands and thousands and thousands of entries and, and be able to drive likes to people's page and get them thousands and thousands of likes. Now I'd be lucky if I can get two, three, four, five hundred kind of entries. So it really has changed a lot. Um, so just my little journey with my Facebook page. So when I started Motivate Me, I um, started that July, the page. Then I didn't launch the business till September. So I used that month period to really try and grow the traction and the interest and build trust in me and kind of, you know, kind of like, you know, make little um, dips into where things were heading um, and little kind of, you know, sneak peeks here and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then by the time that I launched the business, I think I had about 5,000 followers already. So when I had to launch the paid memberships, I was always already talking to people. I think people launch businesses and Facebook pages at the same time, but you're talking to no one because you haven't built that, you know, that following. So that pre-work put into that is really, really key. Um, and then, so July 2012 to 2017, so the first, sorry, 13, I got 10,000 followers in the first year. And because I was a page, one of few, I guess, at that time, I was really lucky to get a bit of media attention, so I got a couple of magazine articles and stuff like that. And that second year, in 2013 to 14, I jumped up 30,000 likes. So I went from 10 to 40,000. So that was my, one of my biggest years. And I, was, I credit that a lot to some cool articles in Good Health magazine and Next magazine and stuff and who mentioned my Facebook page. Um, and again, the algorithm was very loose. The second year, I jumped up another 40,000, so that's when the algorithm really wasn't doing much. Then the, th the fourth year, I jumped 20,000, and that cost a lot of money. That's when the algorithm kicked in. That's when things were really, really hard. Um, can I chuck that over there? Yeah, Thanks. Sure. Um, and I, it cost me a lot of money because I was boosting my posts, promoting my page. I was up spending maybe up to kind of 1,000, because I was at that 80,000 like mark, and I was like, oh, I really need to get to 100. You know, you, you, know, you, you like, might be like at 500. You're like, oh, I want to get to 1,000. But you always try, I was just like, I need to, I don't know, it's a, it's a silly driver, I know, but when you kind of, lots of other pages are coming up in the space, and when you're kind of one of the first, you want to keep staying ahead, obviously, you want to, and for what the work I was doing, I wanted to keep staying ahead. So from 80 to 100 probably cost me about five or $6,000 for the year with um, page promo promotion and boost, pay, post boosting. Because so keep there's a difference. You can promote your page and you can boost a post. All right, and they both have their benefits. You just got to know what you're trying to achieve from both of both of those. Um, and then the the second year, which went from 2016 to now, I'm up to at 125,000, and I've backed off. I haven't spent. I just kind of spent a lot of boosting money in that year to get from 80 to 100, and then I've gone from 100 to 125 without spending a lot of money. And if the money has been spent on boosting, it's come from advertisers and promoters who I'm saying, if you want me to work with you, then you've got to include a boost fee, you know, kind of in that work, because um, it can obviously help your entire page. So in terms of the business, so the business that I sold, Motivate Me, grew with that, the revenue grew with that page likes, and that's why it's kind of important, and it's not just, oh, I've got this many followers. The, the customer and the interest and the potential to sell and convert grows with those numbers. It really does give your business a lot of credibility, gives yourself a lot of good recognition, all those kind of things, but it really does give you a pool of people to speak to really smartly. So the first year of my little business that I started, and it was just really selling memberships to my Motivate Me community, which was a series of private Facebook groups, we turned over, well, I turned over 65,000. Um, the second year, that was probably a half-year trade, and then the second year trade, we turned over, I turned over 105,000. And that's when I was working full time and doing this kind of like oh, at night times and the weekends on my lunch breaks, whenever I could get some time to kind of go online and really try and you know, keep the business running. It was an online women's health and wellness motivational business, which was really structured around online um, membership, membership. So that's where the revenue came from. Then the third year, I gave up my job because it was making some money and I could leave and have a salary. And we, because I went full time in it, it turned over 400,000. So it went from 105 to 400. And then the year, just as I was selling it, it had topped out at 500,000. So that's huge for me. It might not be big for some of you who might be in million dollar businesses and plus, but 500,000 just from a little Facebook page and very small overheads because everything was online and automated and, and done as easily as possible. 
was fantastic. So um, the, the revenue grew with the profile that the page started getting. So that's not just from memberships, that revenue. Because people work it out, they're like, oh, you've got 3,500 members, they pay $99 a year was the membership. That doesn't equal much money, how the hell? You know, so what it did was it paid, uh, members paid a membership, they got added to a private community, which became very engaged. So that engaged, targeted community that was all around women's health and wellness became a targeted customer base for a whole lot of other brands. They knew I had these women in this really, you know, private kept kind of space that if they wanted to advertise their brand, it was going to cost them money or it was going to be really great commission on sales if they got advertised in that market. And that's where a lot of the revenue started growing for the business. On top of that, we introduced clothing, like merchandise um, and clothing. Uh, then I was out doing events and public speaking. So the revenue streams within the business to create that 500 grand were multi. I probably had about, I don't know, eight streams going at one point. And I think that's key when you start a, a young business. You've got to trial multiple revenue streams and see what works really well for yourself, for your customer, what has low overheads versus what you thought, you know, were, you know, the high overheads, low overheads, what's actually successful versus what you thought was going to be successful. And then some will naturally drop off, but others will grow so, so well that they can become standalone businesses. And that's effectively what I did about three or four years into the business. Motivate Me continued with its memberships and kind of commissions and stuff that I did with the members. Myself, I pulled my brand away and established Makaya Car because I wanted Motivate Me to remain itself. So if I was going to ever sell Motivate Me, it would still looked attractive to somebody. Um, and then I set up my own Facebook page and started doing Makaya Car profile stuff. I know it sounds really wanky and it makes me cringe, but you've got to be <laughs> smart about it and do it. And when you've been asked to public speak and do all these sorts of things, you want to you know, run your revenue through that. And then MFIT became a standalone business, which was the clo fitness clothing, fitness accessories and things like that. So that also then gave me the opportunity to off-sell different streams that, as new businesses. And that's what I did. So I sold MFIT, the clothing business, in November last year, kept Makaya Car, obviously, and Motivate Me, and then sold Motivate Me um, February this year. So that's kind of, I guess, the really quick journey that I took with a Facebook page. Can, can I ask what you were doing, because I, I, you probably weren't a vet or something like that, and then decided to get into this business, so <laughs> what were you doing to leave to go into this business? Like, were you learning the same sorts of skills that you could use no, for when you did so, this? No, you know, everyone thinks I'm a nutritionist or a PT, and I'm not either of those things. I actually grew up in retail, so I started in um, with Glassons as a 19-year-old working in the stockroom, and then spent about 10 years working for Tim, uh, Tim Glasson in the Glassons group. Um, in every role possible. So I was in management, regional management, national management, fashion buying, marketing, and things like that. I never went to uni, dropped out of high school really young, um, so there's no big qualification behind me. But what I did do was work really hard in a business that um, I was passionate about. So health and wellness and women's health and wellness was a passion, but I had really strong, I guess, business sense or business savvy just from my career with um, Glassons. Moved on to Max Fashions for five years as a national retail manager. Um, and then the job that I was doing when I was running Motivate Me, I was a regional manager for a finance company. So I was learning a lot more around finances and how to read a P&L properly and what a cash flow you know, looked like and balance sheet and all those sorts of things. So I have been self-taught a lot along the way. And um, yeah, and I guess that background really helped me decide how I was going to launch this passion because I think so many of us can go into business with a really strong passion and a real desire to help people but not really get in the right advice or have the right mindset to to turn it into a business and turn it into an option that has longevity to it. You know, you need to be able to see how is that, where is the sales going to grow? Is there potential for this to grow? What other revenue streams can I add in there to really make things a lot easier? Um, yeah, I think. Were you, were you into plans, though? One year, two year, five year? Or do you kind of think, oh, yeah, whatever. Do, do, you know, when you started, did you have that in your mind? No, the, the only goal I had in mind was um, as soon as I started the business, I, I was like, right, I'm going to make this work. It's going to be my empire one day. And my goal was set by my husband, who pretty much said, you're not leaving your job until your business is making your salary. And, it, and, it, and I was like, oh, fuck you, I want to leave. Like, <laughs> I want to leave now because I, I know I can do a really good job at this. But when you've got a mortgage and you know, bills and a family and all that sort of stuff, you can't one partner or one you know, thing just walk away from the responsibilities and, and leave the salary. So I hated it, but it was a clear goal. So as soon as my business made enough money to sustain my salary and I could contribute to the household from my business, then I was like, full gun, you know, full steam ahead. And I think that's sometimes another mistake is that we start businesses, we leave our jobs, 
and we go into our new business and we struggle and we stress and we, you know, work 24-7 just to kind of make ends meet, um, pay the staff, pay the bills and hardly even take home a salary. And then, and sometimes I'm like, well, that's not why we start a business. Sometimes we start a business for lifestyle and for, you know, and to make things a bit easier. Um, so I, some, I do say to people, don't jump straight in. Like, if you can maintain your job and a new business at the same time, still have an income coming in and take some of that pressure off yourself. Because sometimes you can make really bad business decisions when you're desperate for money, when you're desperate to pay a bill or pay the mortgage. Don't panic. Don't be desperate. It's real bad. Don't be desperate. Yeah. What about, but it is brand you, right? So it could it have worked if you had started up Motivate Me with not your face and with everything that you were doing? Because people were into you, right? Yeah, well, you know, I think anyone's into whoever is the face of the brand. Uh, the, one of the smart things I did, and back then I could see there was a few personal trainers and things like that that had business pages or even businesses um, with their name in it. There was the, I did toy out when I was branding and doing things. I was like, oh, this could be Makaya's motivational blah, 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 or Makaya this and Makaya that. But really, really smart thing was not for, to include my name in the company name. Very hard, unless you're Les Mills or Michael Hill, to on-sell a business that has your name in it. I, I think that anyway, unless you've done an incredible job at branding nationally, if you can just be a bit smarter about your company name, so many other people will be able to successfully on-sell a business and also detach themselves personally from where that business is going and look more objectively about a business that I want to sell as opposed to, oh, that's my, my, got my name on it. It needs to look like this and I like pink and, and all this sort of stuff. So, and another thing was too, I didn't put pink in the colour. Everyone was like, it's a woman's business and pink's so good. And I was like... Pink makes me cringe, but then one day, <laughs> if I wanted to open the business up to men, men are not going to buy into a pink business. Purple, maybe it was purple, was my colours, and you were wearing purple, so you would have bought into it. So, yeah, so there are little things to really take into account when you're starting your business and your branding, because once you've nailed that logo at the beginning, and that's one of the most exciting parts, is choosing your logo, it, it does set the tone for a very long time, because you won't be changing it anytime soon, you know, maybe three to five years, not, not three to five months, like some people chop and change their logos. What about those early days when you, uh, social media, and you know, you started when it was, when social media had just started, really, and then so, you know, what about the desperate days, where, oh my god, I've only got like 58 likes, and then you're trying to get to a thousand, and so how do you get over those times? Now, or back then? Back then. Oh, that was, it was easy back then, I like, I remember the, one of the biggest competitions I ran, I think um, Usain, Us, Usain Bolt had just ra, won, run some race in some bright yellow Nike Free shoes. It's when Nike Freeze were just kind of launched in 2012, 2013. And now they were everywhere. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to need to give some of those away. So I, I was going to buy them. So I would buy them. So obviously Nike doesn't sponsor me back then. Well, not at all now. But um, I was like, right, I'm going to run a competition. So I ran a competition with those bright yellow Nike Free, uh, Nike Freeze. And it, got, it gained like a thousand entries and a thousand likes kind of in the first couple of days because it was a hot piece. It was in the media everywhere. It was topical. It was topical. And it was, a, you know, a really good algorithm, kind of practical, well, no algorithm back then. Um, and I just went out and bought the price. But I, I, I posted it like, oh my God, look what I've got my hands on. I've got these cool Nikes I can give away to someone and talk up this hype. And I was like, enter here, like the page, do all those sorts of things. And then when I drew the winner, I was like, wow, what size are you? Rent down the shop, bought them, cost me, what, 150 bucks, but got 1,000 likes for the, for the effort. So 1,000 <laughs> likes for these shoes, yeah, man. Yeah. Okay, well, we've got a few I've, questions I've here, Makaya. William, where are you, William? You've, you've sent a question in. Thank you, William. Um, how did you value Motivate Me when you sold it? So when I first listed the company, I actually went to a broker, um, business broker, to help me do that because it was really hard because obviously I thought it was worth millions of dollars. <laughs> Still think it was. Um, but clearly it wasn't. And so I went to a broker who helped me really kind of build. And that's, that's why that drive to getting those email, you know, emails were more valuable to, the, to likes. But even trying to teach them to understand the power of social media was even harder. He used it as a bit of a um, practice for himself, like as a trial for himself. Like, how do I value this business that is purely on, so on social media? Um, but I guess a lot of people didn't actually realise there's a lot of tangible stuff behind the business that I had. Um, there's a lot of product. We had 45 private Facebook groups that he had to val uh, value. All our members were in those. So a lot of engaged... It was all about database, really, at the end of it, and brand and how, val how to value the brand in the health and wellness space and on and, and the thing, and revenue. So the revenue was there and the potential to make profit is a value in itself. So if it's a valuable business and it's making profit, then, you know... Someone else can do that too, and it can put, hold some value. What about Nikki? Where are you, Nikki? 
Thank you, Nikki. Did you always intend to sell when you started? No, I didn't. And I thought it was going to be my baby forever and I was going to have a national empire, motivate me centres all around the country, company cars, big head office. It's all on my vision board. And um, <laughs> then I was just having a discussion with a, a mum one day on a school trip, actually. And I don't ever do school trips, but this one must have had to be. I'm not a school mum. And she was a business mentor. And she, she just asked me, she's like, what's your exit strategy for your business? And I was like, hmm, what's that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And she was like, well, you need to consider, you know, consider one because you need to have a, you know, a goal to kind of prepare the business for and all that sort of stuff. She talked to me, talked to me about sale and she kind of got me excited about sale. And so from that point on, I actually hired her as my mentor for six months and she talked to me about all other um, strategies and opened me up to the world of, um, you know, it's not bad to sell your business and it's not, uh, it was not a bad thing to sell your baby and your idea. Well, your baby it is, but your, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> That's a shocking idea. Yeah, I'll sell my baby some days. No, um, yeah, I think when we start a passion business, we totally never open up to the idea of selling it, but we should because our idea generally is going to be so smart and so successful that we could make a lot of money and then you can go on and do other amazing things. Thank you. Yes. Ta. Um, so now all I want to do is start businesses and sell them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The vision board, actually. I'd like to know about the vision board. Is it, um, is it what is it? It's, yeah. a, it's a piece of cardboard. And I, um, I should have had a photo. I usually have a photo of it. But I made one about three or two and a half, three years ago. And a vision board is so powerful. If you have the time, no one has the time, but make some time. And um, it sounds really like a kindergarten, but cut out some pictures. <laughs> Glue them on a board. Like a collage. <laughs> like a collage. It is a, it's like a cut and paste session. But it is very powerful. But don't use magazines because you can never find the photos that you want. So Google your images that you want, print them out, cut them out, put them on your board. But it's really cool for people that are visual so you can look at them and really remain focused every day on where are you taking your business? Where are you taking your family? Where are you taking your individual self? And I include all that on there. My family goals, my business goals, and my personal goals for education or development or whatever it is and have that in your office or wherever you can see it every day because it is a really cool kind of reminder. And actually, when you're stuck or you're struggling to make a really hard decision in your business, sometimes looking at your vision board or your initial goals will help you make that decision. If it's going to help you get to that, then, then do it. If it's not, then don't do it. But I should um, push this button because I actually have... Oh, Nikki's got another question. Oh. Yep, yep. So it was myself for two and a half years, and then I hired a part-timer, and then I had a part-timer and a full-timer and another part-timer in the last kind of two years. Yeah, so one person worked remotely completely. She was a, one, a member who was at home, and she worked part-time um, when she was at home with her baby doing online kind of Facebook management stuff for me. Then I leased an office down the road from my house, which was really handy, and a full-timer would come in and work for me, which was really good, and then another part-timer who would come in and help with with stuff as well. So that was a big step, actually hiring staff, but it was crucial because it helped the business maintain where it was at and expand in some areas. Mm. Anyway, so after that long ramble, um, so these are the three topics that I'm talking about tonight. I've just talked about the first one, uh, my journey with social media and business. So that, that's pretty much it. If there's anyone that has any questions on my personal journey with um, social media, Facebook, business, then I'm happy to answer those. Otherwise, I'm going to move into um, how to get your brain noticed in this crowded and noisy social media world that it currently is, because it's very tough. And then I'm going to talk about how to use social influencers effectively. Does anyone work with social influencers at the moment? I know you do. You do. And no, you guys do. Anyone else work with social influencers? Anyone considered working with social influencers for, to grow their business? Yes? Hopefully there's a couple, because I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Please give me a reason to talk about it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, because I think it is an av avenue that needs to be looked at for many businesses. It is. Like, it's been part of my job and my um, turnover for my business for the last few years. And it can be a career if you're on the other side and you want to do it, if you do it well. Um, but it's also a very effective way to advertise and um, convert, attract sales, attract new customers, attract social media growth, all those sorts of things. So I'll talk about that. Any questions before I move on? Uh, sorry, yes. One, one question before you move on to point number one. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about different revenue streams? So you mentioned 
the close community members, they actually pay some sort of a fee. Yes. And uh, annual prices. What yeah. are the different categories when it comes to social media context? So I would have um, down like any kind of down like ebooks, so downloads that you can sell. So you have your free. I always have free downloads available because that's a really good way to get traction and get emails and get interest. But then have add-ons like paid versions, so paid ebooks or paid downloads or paid content, paid video, all that sort of stuff. That's online. Do the job once, get it online. It's always going to make you money forever and ever. You know that anything that's passive and can keep ticking over is gold. You know, and so it's a really good um, option to have that. I also had um, commission agreements, so any kind of brand I would align with would either have a, a paid ambassador role, so whether it's just a paid fee to the company to promote their products throughout a period of time, or if we align with the company and we drive sales through our community, what is the commission percentage that the business gets for driving that promotion into our community. Um, merchandise, so any kind of merchandise that would relate to our brand. Uh, events, so any kind of events we set up for our members, we would then have a component that's available to non-members to attend, but they would pay to be there, you know. So anything you kind of do, you've just got to figure out how you can earn money off it, really. And, um, but it, for me, it was always about making sure that my members were priority and got value for their membership cause so that they would still renew. Because their membership renewals, once they joined and they renewed and renewed, then that passive income would keep flowing too. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thousand likes, were they all paying members? No, so that's a page following is now at 125,000 likes. But the memberships would, so the first year my members were at like 500, the second year I think I sat at about 800, um, third year I kind of got up to about 2,500, then I topped up around 3,000, 3,200 with a mixture of new and renewed in there. Um, so that's, that's the paid membership. So that's what I said before, if you do the numbers on that, that's like, well, that's not so much. So that's why having a low value membership or low value entry point worked for me because I know once I had them in, I had them engaged in all these other revenue streams that worked even better for me. You know what I mean? Make it easy for people to get in and then give them, then they're in this world where they're just totally into the whole lifestyle, into the concept and into the brand. We had another question over here somewhere. Yeah, um, you mentioned the value for, for members. What were the tangible benefits of, of that membership? So it wasn't a lot. It was all online. So in 2012, that was really hard to explain. Like, really hard. They're like, I've just joined. What do I get? I'm like, oh, well, you got added to our private Facebook groups. You've got access to your own profile on the website. You've got these um, download, you know, eating plans and recipes. And you've got these member discounts that these retailers were uh, um, aligned with. So all of these benefits, but none of it is actually tangible. So that in the first kind of six to 12 months was really, really hard to explain. But once I got those first few hundred of members in there, the word of mouth on social media about what the, the feeling and the vibe that they were getting in the group is what then really grew my business after that. Because it, that's what it was. They were paying to be part of a community. They weren't paying to receive anything in the mail or you know, sent out to them. That, and selling a community and selling that woo-woo, you know, that feeling stuff is hard. But now, it's, but now it's quite common because lots of people are doing, you know, community or memberships and all that online type of stuff. The online business is so huge now that people kind of get it. But I did find that tangible things did mean a lot. So it's when we introduced the merchandise line because they were in the online membership group, they wanted to go to events and rep the brand. So they would then buy anything that I put Motivate Me on. Anything I put on Motivate Me, the ladies would love to wear the tops, the hoodies, sure. the drink bottles, so that then was in, out repping and motiv um, promoting the brand as well. So, All right, so let's rock on with social influencers. Yeah. Don't forget um, the Moby site, so you can just ask any question on here as well. Have you got the time on that iPad? I have, um, 6.33. Okay, cool. Alrighty, so I've talked about that. How to get your brand noticed in this crowded and noisy space. So I think another thing is, is there a business in here that is not on Facebook? No? Still? Still? I didn't mean to say that. Um, <laughs> but I think every business should be on Facebook. Um, Facebook is where business can be conducted. Instagram, for instance, is where businesses will promote brands. Um, it's, quite a you know, it's obviously a visual thing, but it's a brand promotion thing. Facebook is so smart, you can conduct business on Facebook. They are trying to encourage people to conduct business on Facebook. We buy things off Facebook every single day. And with, uh, what are the stats, nearly 2 million, I think it's like 1.98 billion, billion active monthly users on Facebook, you'd be silly not to. If just one or two of those billions of people saw your stuff, then it's worth it. Because it's free. That's the biggest thing. It's a free advertising channel. 
Now, I know a lot of people are not on Facebook because they're like, oh, I hate Facebook. Everyone just, it's just baggage. Everyone just moans and groans and events and it's negative and I'm just, you know, not like that. Um, you don't have to be. As a business, you can just have the Pages app. Like, a, if, you don't, if you don't have the Pages app and you have a business Facebook page, then you need to get it. Um, download the Facebook Pages app and run your pages through that. You will never accidentally comment under your personal profile. Um, it, you're going to be a lot more kind of reactive to it and you can have those notifications on. You can turn the no notifications off on your personal Facebook page if you like but, um, and ignore all that sort of stuff. What I'm trying to say is that you can have a business page without being personally on Facebook and use the Pages app to do that. Now, to get noticed in this crowded space these days, you do have to have a marketing budget. You do have to be prepared to spend money on your page, on your posts, on your influences, on whatever you're doing. Use it like a form of advertising. When I'm negotiating my um, paid work and things like that, in, back in the day it was really, really hard. So a few years ago it was like, really? You charge that? How could you charge that for a Facebook post or Instagram photo? Really? But you've got to look at it these days like... Uh, magazine or newspaper advertising. You know when they send through all those emails and you can get this advertising space here for a few hundred dollars or you can get a bigger space for a thousand dollars? That's how you look at it. You can get this photo on this person's following on their Instagram account with this following, with this engagement for you know hundreds or thousands of dollars, whatever it is. That's how you have to see it as paid advertising space. And once you start looking at it like that, you'll start seeing that person's interaction and engagement with a business perspective and not a personal perspective and you'll be prepared to pay the money if you can then get the insights. And the beauty is with social media, you can get the insights. You can see where your money is going and what return on investment you're getting. It's really hard to get that on radio, billboard and newspaper, things like that these days. So, you know, you might just choose to spend $100 over three days for promoting your page or, your, or a boost. And the beauty is you can go into the ad app so the Facebook ad app, or and you can monitor how your ad's going. So for me, when I'm boosting um, or promoting my page to try and grow likes and get attention and all those sorts of things, if my like cost is over 50 cents per like, I stop the ad and I re-edit it. I might change the image. I might redo it. Because anything over 50 cents for me, when I look at all my average, is costing way too much to get a like. Um, if I'm boosting a post, though, and I'm looking for engagement, like click through to a website or click through to a link or whatever, if my cost per link is over 20 cents, I stop it. Um, if it's around 10 cents, I let it go because it's quite a, it's a really good cost. Um, and that's just based on my average with my history. So, and you'll see that with your ad history of where you're kind of, when you first start out, it might be a dollar a like or 50 cents per engagement, but you don't want to run that for too long. You want to try and get those costs down. Um... Another way to get noticed um, on Facebook or just kind of break through, to break through the algorithm really and kind of get to the top of someone's timeline is to use new Facebook tools. So when Facebook launch a new tool like Facebook Live, for instance, that was obviously months ago, but there's still so many people not using it because they're too scared to use it because it's live video, use it. If you're going to use these new tools, they're going to bump that up the timeline. The algorithm will let that through because they want to start seeing data. They want to start seeing statistics and how well it's been used and how well it's been engaged with. So you utilize those. I just saw another new tool that was launched the other day. For anyone that's got a Facebook page, they're now letting you link, and I wish I had this when I had Motivate Me, but they're letting you link a group, a private group, to your public Facebook page. Right, that, that's pretty huge, like for me that feels pretty huge, that they're letting you promote your private group on your public page, because you can drive your followers then to these private groups. When you've got these people in these private groups, and a lot of businesses are starting to do this, creating these private communities, the engagement within those communities are really high. So if you're driving them to these communities from your brand, your business, whatever, it might be saying, oh, you know, we're this business and we're offering this service and we've got these people who are going to help you in this group, get them in there that, that, whatever you post in that group, they're generally going to see it. There's no algorithm, there is, but it's not as strict as the main timeline. The stuff, that you, you get what I mean? Your engagement in that group is going to be good. Your, your ability to convert those people to a sale or to a client or customer is going to be a lot higher. All right, so you do, just look into that if that um, sounds like it could be for you. And they also just add, added a new feature recently where you've got a paid ad going through when someone clicks on it, it's given you the ability to private message them. 
don't know if anyone's seen that one yet. But you can, yeah, if they click it in the, on your ad or engage with your ad, something must pop up, a notification, and you can D, like PM them from your business page to that and start talking with them one-on-one. -on -one. Any kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation between a customer and a brand is gold. The customers are so open online. They're so engaged. They, they feel so special when a brand or a business replies to their comment, when they talk directly to them. That, that loyalty and that buy-in is there straight away. So the more you can do it, the more you're going to convert sales online. And I'd learnt those two things by reading the pop-ups that come up on Facebook. When a new pop-up comes up at the top of your Facebook page to say, new tool or whatever, don't just click the X and close it, <laughs> like we all do. Read it, because some of them are bloody good and really, and really gonna help you drive your page and your business. Um, what else? What's Mackay, can I just talk about um, targeting to your audience? Because uh, a lot of us would, would uh, whether we know our audience implicitly or whether we're still trying to find out who that audience is. So you were saying just try and try and try again and then you're going to figure out who your audience is by just giving it a go. What do you mean? You know, so, so trying to, when, you, when you're on Facebook yeah. and you're trying to find who your audience is and then you're clicking on, uh, you know, women, age this, whatever. Oh, so no, do you, you, know, you know, yeah. You know exactly who's following you. You mean talking about insights and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll get to that when I talk, to, talk about social influencers and working with social influencers about asking them for their insights and asking them for where their followers are from and all these sorts of things. So um, I'm just seeing if there's anything else I want to share on this point. I don't think so. So if I talk about um, how to use social influencers, if you're interested in using social media to even advertise your own business or contact influencers to help advertise your products, your brand, your services, whatever, then I've got some just some great points on how to do that. Um, because it really is a, um, as I said, an option that has really great return on investment. It's having proven sales on the nights that the people were posting about them, the times they're doing the videos, all these sorts of things. I've had some great successes with some really great small businesses who achieved, I don't know, sold shitloads of natural deodorant because I've done a Facebook Live review on natural deodorants, you know, and all those sorts of things. Or helping new businesses launch their services, um, great product reviews. It's... Um, if your influencer has a really great engaged um, audience who are your customer, it can be a really great way to start speaking directly to people that should be buying from you, as opposed to paying for an ad somewhere that speaks to everyone and you're not even sure if it's falling on the lap of the people that could be buying your product. It's a lot smarter way to advertise. So working with an influencer, deciding on an influencer is really key and really important. Don't just go out and choose who looks good or has the most followers, or seems to be getting all the jobs, you need to find the one that is best for your brand, your product, your customer, your business. Um, brand alignment. Do, do their values, do their brand align with what your brand um, philosophies or missions and all those sorts of things are? Um, what platforms are they on? Are they on a platform where your customer is? Are they on a platform where you are? Um, I hopefully you're on most platforms, but be wary of where their strengths are. Is their strength Facebook, but you need it on Instagram and they're not as strong, or vice versa. Um, and monitor their engagement. So before you kind of connect with someone, spend a week or so monitoring their engagement. How are they interacting with their customers? What sort of likes are they getting on different sorts of posts, on personal or emotional posts or branded posts? What sort of um, likes and comments are they getting? What reach are they getting? Whatever stat you can see, you can see a lot just from being a follower on someone else's page. Um, and you know, just be, put some time in doing your own groundwork and really trying to build uh, and a, a really value, I guess, uh, monitored opinion on how they're interacting. And then you want to contact them and actually ask them if they're interested in trying your product. Give them an opportunity to try your product, uh, see what they think about it, and then talk about then talk about a possible business relationship. So many brands will send out products and saying, oh, we'd really love it if you could just post this on your page. It's like, whoa, we haven't even had a discussion about whether I like your stuff. You know, or, in, or this is totally goes against my values of, you know, I don't know Oh, I just got the I got the hurry up sign. Um, <laughs> shit. Okay. Well, you know Mackay, what, you Mackay, know what I'm trying to say. On that, um, Blaine asks, um, interested to hear what you think an influencer should be paid per post. So how do you work out? Everyone the... wants to know what we get paid. Yeah. So it's so different. But um, 
got some influencers start out at 50, 150, 250 a post. Uh, some are up to a $1,500 to $2,500 per post. Uh, so it varies a lot. And obviously that is determined by their number of followers, their levels of engagement, um, the way they conduct themselves on social media, the way they can pull together the post, what are their editing skills like, what are their photography skills like, what, are their, what is their written communication like, do they even have an ability to sell, you know, so there's so many, and that's again where my background in business has really helped me kind of succeed from the outset, I knew that everyone at the end of the day wants a sale, but you can't be so blatant that you're not going to get capture that emotion and capture that relationship and all those engaged people, so you have to be quite... Um, strategic on how you structure your post. It can't just be chuck it up there, everyone buy this, you know, love it type of thing. You've got to look for someone that really speaks to you. Would that post sell to you? Um, so, look, Facebook posts these days, uh, for me, at a, over 100,000, as I said, camp, over 100,000 followers can be anywhere from 1000 to $2,000 per post. That depends if they want to run a giveaway, uh, do they want to drive likes to their page, do they want me to make a recipe? No, oh, because I hate making recipes, so I'm going to charge more for that. And that's how I value my work. If I love the job and I love making a video or something like that, I'll charge uh, you know, a little bit less. But I'm like, oh, don't make me do a recipe. I can't stand it. I'll charge them heaps so they don't want the job. No, so that's kind of how I kind of do it. Um, and if you've got you know, proven success with business campaigns and stuff you've had, you can justify that. What I want to say, though, is... When you are kind of engaging with them, ask those questions because there's always those people out there and there still is who have loved the game of social media and blogging and all this sort of stuff and gone and bought all these fake-ass followers. Ask for their insights. Ask for screenshots of their insights. Where are their followers from? What country are they bloody from? Are they from India or Africa or Russia or Pakistan or something? You know, you want news. You, where are your customers? You're not going to sell your product to these, these ones. They might have 300 or 200,000 followers, but you need to know where they live, what are their ages, what sex are they. You might be a woman, so, you know, find out if they're male or female. I can tell you that of my 100, and this is from just Facebook Insights. You know, you can get all that information. So for them to say, oh, no, I can't find that, click on your Insights button and screenshot and send it to me if you want this job. You need to be that direct. You need to know where your money's going and what you can expect from it. Um, but there's also a great website called sproutsocial.com. Uh, you can do. You can get a free month trial, and if you've got lots of address, email addresses, you can get lots of free trials, um, which is what I've done. But you can get great reporting out of this website that really gives um, great PDFs on all your demographics for your page. It can combine pages. It can combine Instagram, Facebook, all these sorts of things. Uh, of my 125,000 followers, 97,000 live in New Zealand, 15,000 live in Australia, 4,000 live in USA, and the rest are spread all over the world. 89% are female, 11% are male, 70% uh, of my followers are aged between 25 and 45, and that's what you know, I can prove to my um, brands that I work with that this is who I'm talking to when Facebook lets me talk to them. Um, always have, like, have a discussion with the influencer and say, how do you think you can best sell this product for me? How do you best think that you can promote this product for me? They might absolutely love video. So they might be able to create a great video on that product. And, and the, if they love it, that passion is going to come through from a, through the genuine, authentic, you know, all that positive vibe is going to come through that video. If you force them to do a blog review, which I hate blogs and I hate recipes, so I'm like, no, I don't want to do those. But I love doing video. I love doing Facebook Live. I love doing that sort of stuff because that's when my followers are going to get the best from me and really believe what I speak about. So talk to them about what their best form of communication is or their best form of promotion. Make sure you use their platform with the biggest following. Um, make draft approvals quick and easy. So sometimes I work with brands are like, oh, yeah, you need to submit the draft by this time. Then they take ages to get back to you and all this sort of stuff. A lot of influencers, and especially me, run with passion, like post with passion and post on the moment and really get the best posts in, you know, in that time. So if you have to think four days ahead, oh, what am I going to be doing then? What's the, you know, and what situation am I going to be in? If you can cut that out and just say, right, uh, text me the image and text me the quote or the, the contact, I will text back a reply and you can post it then and there. You're going to get a much better response because it's kind of more real and it's in the moment. Make sure your social handles are set up correctly and the same on every platform if you can. Some may be taken. Some, pe some companies set up Facebook pages with weird names that don't reflect their company name. And when you go to tag them in or recognise them on social media, you can't even find them. You go at 
blah, 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 whatever their business is, but it's, got n it's not even that. It's like something completely different. Or they've added .co.nz on the end of it for some weird reason, and it's hard to find. So have your social handles really succinct and consistent through all your platforms. Um, and then when you hire someone to do this job for you, engage with them and their page through that campaign time. If you, someone is, if I'm prom promoting your brand tomorrow night, you know, text me like, oh, really excited about your post coming up. And then when I post it live, watch it and comment on the post. So when people are saying, oh my God, that's so cool. Where can I get that? Oh, how much is it? What size does it come in? What color does it come in? Be there on your business page, not your personal page, because that's weird when people do that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, I'll make sure the owner and you can get it in this. It's like, no, use your business page. That's why you have it. Um, and be there and answer those questions. Then you can answer those questions, drive them to the website, and you're going to get sales. And I have the most successful nights, the two-hour campaign or whatever, when me and the business are tag teaming and all over it for that period of time. It's lots of fun, and you see lots of sales drivers, and you get quite excited. Um. So we'll do some questions, eh? Let's get, um, so if, uh, we can, you can uh, fill your drinks up really soon. Um, I've only got but, two more points to share, and then I'm done. Okay. But well, if you have a question, go. Any questions from the audience? Because I've got a few coming through here on uh, Moby 2. Anyone want to ask anything? No. Oh. What do you think the cap should be for an influencer over, say, a day or a week in terms of how many brands they should endorse? What is how the cap for an influencer, is the question? How many brands or just how many promotional products? Products or post? brands, yeah. I don't know. Like, who's setting the cap for the individual? Yeah, I, I think it's an individual, individual feel like... that's born out of um, the, my observation that there seem to be a few influencers out there who are accepting a lot of... Everything and anything under yeah, the sun and yeah. going to everything... Uh, and it starts to feel like it's getting saturated. Yeah, it is. And I think... Oh, it's, it's interesting. I think your intention when you start out... Some people start out to be a blogger, you know, to be, to be these people that receive everything and post about it. Like, that's their thing. Um, I think the really strong influencers have started out with a different motive or different motivation. I started as Motivate Me, a business who was willing, you know, wanting to help women um, be healthy and fit. Um, it, all these other, you know, Simone's another, uh, Simone Anderson's another big influencer. She started out with a weight loss journey. Um, another one who kind of, uh, I, I do a lot of work with, Millie from Clean Eats is another one. She started out with her journey of healthy eating. You start out with this purpose that is not about receiving products and posting products. It's just a benefit that comes from your ulterior thing. Um, but then it's all the other bloggers that are out there that are doing it for a job. You know, and, and that's, I guess, what it makes. It makes your timeline very cluttered with the same... You know when a PR company is a seeded product? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, because everyone kind of posts about it at the same time. It's like, oh, God, all the bloggers have got this pack. But it, as a... Um, for me, personally, I have three to four brands that I have long-term contracts with, so tw six to 12-month contracts, so they will forever be my main focus. Um, and their agreements really are around one to two posts per month. You know, so it's not a weekly thing. It's one, two posts minimum per month. And then other ad hoc work would come in maybe one to two posts per week. That's kind of where I, I fit. Because you've got to have a main message. You've got to have what is, what is your purpose for being there? What is your purpose for being online and speaking to people and having this audience? Um, but then like, on the flip side, it is different for other people. Some of their purpose is to showcase new products that are dro dropping in the beauty industry or the health industry or, or whatever. So I guess it comes down to who you follow on how cluttered your timeline is. Unfollow the ones that, you know, are cluttering up your timeline. Kim's asking, um, did you envisage um, the business evolving into what it has with different revenue streams right from the beginning no. or is it something that evolved? Yeah, absolutely evolved. I didn't even know what a blogger... Well, I don't think anyone knew what a social influencer back in 12, 2012. I don't think it even existed. I didn't even know what a blogger was back in 2012. Um, my business vision and goal back then was to start Motivate Me, sell lots of memberships, have lots of women in this community, hopefully one day have a gym or kind of something like that. Um, but... This new world back then was like, whoa, she's got this page. It's got 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people that follow it. And then even brands didn't know what to do with pages back then. You know, so I'd, I think the first package I got on my doorstep was a jar of peanut butter. I was like, holy shit, those people are sending me stuff. It's getting peanut butter and coconut oil and all these sorts of things. And I was like, whoa, putting it all over social media, thinking I'm really like, well, I was a special, I was getting free stuff. And that carried on for like a year, you know, just doing like free, free stuff. And then all of a sudden you start realizing your value. You start realizing what you're giving these brands and you're like, shit, I'm creating shit loads of sales for that company. I think I need a piece of that pie. You know, and then so going through that journey of actually establishing value was really hard and it is, still is hard for people who are figuring out what to charge people. But because I had a business that was making money and revenue, that's how I valued my time. I'm like, okay, 
company, you want me to take a, two hours out of my day to make a recipe, take a photo, write some content, get it approved and get it online, that's two hours away from my business. In that two hours, when I'm focused on my business, I know I can turn over this much. So if you want me to take two hours away from my business to do that, you're going to pay me that. And if you're not, then that's fine. I'll go to motivate me and I'll keep working on my business. So that's how I managed to do it. And I thought, and for me, that felt the smart thing to do. Then I'm making the right decisions on the right jobs that were worth my time to do, um, along with the values and alignment with brand and things like that. Anna's asking Facebook over Instagram. Um, everyone should be on Facebook. Instagram, you should be on Instagram if you've got a very visual business, whether you're fashion, design, makeup, photography, anything that's beautiful to look at. Um, or you just want to grow your brand awareness. If you've got a beautiful brand, get it on Instagram. But conduct business on Facebook because they're creating tools to do that all the time. Now, I've just got these you might be interested in. So if you have no budget for influencers and you want to work with people to, or even if you're... Um, Sorry, if you have budget, another tip is to hire a really good PR company because there's some good ones out there. Um, there's a lot of ones I, I work with Mango a lot, so they do really great work for brands. Bear PR is another one. She's actually up here, uh, so I thought I'd better say her. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Media Jam is another one. So there are three that I actually do quite a lot of work with, and they're great for small to medium businesses who want to get into the PR and social, uh, social world, digital world, um, and get good return on. But if you have no budget and you want to work with influencers, here's a few tricks. So, influencers and bloggers really love personalised product. So if you send something out that's got their name on it, they're more than likely going to post a photo. Because it makes them feel really special. At the end of the day, it's all about ego. There's so much ego driven behind all this stuff that if you can tap into their ego and make them feel really special, then, then do that. And it might be just being creative with a PR kit or a product or a, you know, a T-shirt or, I don't know, I got a spoon once that had... Uh, one of my favourite quotes and my name on it and for some yoghurt company and I was like, oh, I've got to post this. This is a cool spoon. Oh, man, peanut yeah. butter yoghurt. Yeah, you got it all. totally. A chopping board that had my um, Motivate Me engraved uh, thing carved into it. <laughs> uh, any kind of T-shirt. Anything that's personalised that makes them really special or makes them realise that you've been following their brand. Could be their brand tagline or could be their favourite quote, as I mentioned. That's like, whoa, they're really taking notice. So that's a little trick. Um, creating a competition for influencers. So there's been... A couple of recent events where I'm like, should I gave that brand lots of good coverage because they incentivized me to win something. So there was actually a while ago, there was an uh, electric company that sent out a whole lot of things to influencers. And in the media kit to influencers, they said, for every influencer that posts about this using this hashtag, goes in the draw to win a big, flash, fancy Canon camera. And how, how, top, how good is that? Every blogger or influencer wants a kick-ass camera. So everyone was posting, they were getting all this coverage for free, not having to pay a cent to the influencers because everyone wanted to win that camera. And a recent event I went to was with um, Nespresso at a bar, and um, they were just launching their mini Nespresso machine, and they said on the night, for any influencer or blogger that was there for the night, posted a photo using a particular hashtag, we're going to the draw to win a mini Nespresso. I posted about six photos, and I won one which is so cool. But it, they didn't cost them a thing, and they got six images posted from that night um, promoting their product and their brand event. So that is huge PR, just for giving away, running a competition and creating that little uh, excitement. Um, what else? And building personal relationship. So um, Whoop right here, her, this, uh, this lovely man works for Whoop, which is World on a Plate. World on our plate? On a plate. Um, which is pre-made meals uh, delivered to Auckland, soon to be released in Wellington. Um, these guys are really good at building personal relationships with people. So, if, if, And then you just want to promote their brand for free because they're great buggers. They're great people with a great product. You believe in them and you, they look after you and you're just going to put it out there. So having those long-term relationships where there's a lot of respect and a lot of give and take, then they are really, really worthwhile and valuable to both parties. Um, and that's about it. Be smart. Ask for, if you're going to pay for advertising or you see your products on a blogger's Insta story or Instagram or Facebook, ask them for insights. Don't be afraid. They love the fact that you've noticed it, so reply and say, hey, thanks for the Insta story snap or thanks for the Facebook mention or whatever. And just say, hey, would you mind screenshotting the insights for that and sending it to me? Some might say no, but most should say yes. Then it's going to give you a real insight into what that's really reaching. I know a lot of brands at the moment are seeding product and influencers are just putting on Insta story and they're not liking that as much as Instagram photos. 
But if you ask that influencer for the screenshot of the Insta story, you can see how many views that's getting. Sometimes the views on an Insta story are more than the reach an Instagram photo has achieved or a Facebook reach has, um, Facebook post has achieved. So ask for that information because you'll start feeling better about those decisions going forward that you're choosing to do. And I think that is all I have to say. Mikhail Carr, big Thank round you. of applause.